Greetings and welcome to the latest edition of the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast. As always, I am your host, Martin, and I'm happy to have you with me today. For this week's episode, we are diving back into the Facilitating 5-MeO-DMT Anthology book, and my guest is Patrick, who is one of the contributors from the book. He joined me uh, last week from the East Coast of the United States, and we had a great conversation getting into his background a little bit more than what's presented in the book and how he got into facilitating 5-MeO-DMT and a little bit more of his history and personal take on it all in there. And we'll be bringing that to you very, very shortly, but first, just a couple very brief announcements. We'd like to thank Dylan, who has joined back up as a patron over at Patreon. He was there, and then he was gone, and then he was back again, then he was gone, now he's back again. So Dylan, it's great to have you over there. Of course, this is a listener-supported podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast with either a PayPal donation or by joining up as a patron over at Patreon, both are quite easy to do. Just stop by my personal webpage, www.martinball.net, and use the PayPal link or the Patreon link that are at the top right of the page. Also, this week, I have a very special thank you going out to Nathan J. Roger. And Nathan is someone who, uh, a few years ago now, volunteered to make a Spanish translation of my 2009 book, Being Human. And it's all done, and it's out, and it's available now. Um, As of recording this, I'm actually recording this just a couple days into the week here Um, but it's available on Kindle and it's been making its way through the paperback approval process. So that may or may not be ready by now today when this podcast is going out, but that's in the works. And, uh, actually I've I've had the final version of Nathan's translation for a couple months now, and it's just taken me a while to actually get into it and format the whole thing and then reformat the cover and put it into Spanish and all of that. But, Uh, It's all thanks to Nathan. He just took up this project all on his own, and he's actually working on another translation for me right now. So thank you so much, Nathan. It's really excellent. And, you know, I can't check it because I don't speak or read Spanish, but I'm just assuming that it's great. So thank you very much, Nathan. And so you can let any Spanish speakers know out there that uh, Being Human is now available in Spanish. Uh, Siendo Humano. There you go. All right, well, let's go ahead and get to this conversation with Patrick, once again, from the Facilitating 5-MeO-DMT Anthology book. Hope you enjoy this conversation. Uh, More from Orbi's vision next week, second to last chapter. Oh my goodness, almost done. Then we have a conversation with Rack Razam, also from the Facilitating 5-MeO-DMT book. And then, of course, there is more to come on the podcast. All right, thanks for listening. Thanks for your support. Talk to you next week. Oh, and before I go, just a reminder, if you need someone to talk to to help integrate your 5-MeO-DMT experience, I'm, of course, available for 30, 60, and 90-minute consultations of video calls to help you sort through whatever it is that you're going through. Just reach out if you'd like to set that up. You can also check out www.nondualentheogenicintegration.com. Okay, here's my conversation with Patrick. Enjoy. So uh, here we are on the Entheogenic Evolution podcast, and I have a brand new guest for all of you out there in listener land today. Uh, We are speaking with Patrick, and Patrick is one of the contributors to the recent anthology that I put out, Facilitating 5-MeO-DMT, an anthology of approaches to serving the God molecule. And Patrick's entry, which is, by the way, it's it's really excellent. I'm really happy with your entry, Patrick. It comes pretty Mm -hmm. much smack dab in the middle of the book, almost exactly in the middle. And I gave it the chapter title of fractal expressions of the one based on some of the things that you wrote in your section. And so I just want to start just by thanking you for participating in the book project. And I'm just kind of curious, how was that for you um, in writing your contribution? Oh, sure. Well, first, I want to say thank you for inviting me to participate in the book. I'm really honored, and it was a really fun project, and I'm really happy with how it came out. So thanks for putting that together. It's it's really great. Um, And thanks for inviting me to be on your podcast. Um, But as far as the process of writing the book, to be honest, that's probably the first time I've written more than an email in probably like 15 years. So (laughs) it was a good project for me to kind of get writing again. Um, 
And to be honest, the writing process, I would say it was like a lot of really just automatic writing. I would kind of wake up. As soon as you told me about it, I was like, okay, I kind of started to, to think about it and feel into what I might want to say. And then, you know, I would just wake up in the morning and set the intention of what, you know, what is important for people to know about Bufo and the experience. And I would just kind of write ideas and I would, you know, just automatically kind of like automatic writing, just write down whatever ideas came to mind. And I just had a couple of notebooks full of ideas. And then, you know, I spent a couple of weeks waking up every day and just writing down any ideas. And then, you know, I spent a couple weeks after that just editing and organizing and making it mm -hmm. coherent. And I want to thank my partner, Lauren, who also helped me edit and kind of, you know, proofread and make sure it was coherent. And um, I didn't sound too much like a lunatic. So. Mm, not, <laughs> um, not at yeah, all. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was the writing process. And, you know, I proofread it a couple of times and then sent it over to you and. Um, yeah, I'm really happy with how it came out, and I'm really happy with the title you chose. I think that's perfect. So, oh, cool. Thank you for that. Yeah, well, I think it's a great entry. Um, I, I like the way that you have it organized and sort of the flow of topics, and it's it's clear that you're someone who is coming from a place of deep knowledge and reflection about Bufo and about the experience, and so there's... Um, I would say there's an authoritative sense uh, to your contribution of, of what you've written. And I don't mean that in like a, a domineering kind of way in any sense, just that you can tell, okay, Patrick, he's got something to say and he knows what he wants to say and, and how to say it. And it comes through very well in your contribution. So when, when I received it, I was just ecstatic, you know, it's like, Oh, oh this, great. this is I'm fantastic. Oh, yeah, thank you. Cause you never know, you never know what you're going to get. And you know, the writing process, um, for some people it's very easy and for others it's it's like pulling teeth and you know I never know when I was asking people oh do you want to contribute and I definitely had some people who really wanted to but they just they couldn't manage the writing part it was just too much for them which I get yeah, yeah. I could see that and I was honestly a little bit apprehensive and maybe a little bit intimidated before I was like I haven't like I said I haven't written anything in you know 10 or 15 years um but the process was, you know, it was just flowed, you know, it just, just flowed. So I'm happy with it, how it came out. And, um, yeah, as you know, it's like, there's so many multidimensional aspects to the Bufo experience that there's a lot to write about. There's a lot to comment on. So, um, I'm happy that it's, you know, it's pretty coherent because there's a lot going on in the Bufo experience. Yeah, there, there definitely is. And so that's something that I do want to talk to you about, you know, some of the ideas that come up in your contribution. Um, but as I'd mentioned to you, one of the places that I wanted to start is talking a little bit more about your own background and how you got into this so that in your contribution, we don't get a lot of personal information about you. We get your approach and your ideas and what you think it's all about, um, which again, I think is just excellently articulated. Um, but I'm always interested to, to know the people a little bit more. So I'd like to invite us to kind of start there at this point and um you know as much as you want to share about how you got involved with bufo in in the first place and maybe your own experiences with psychedelics how you became interested in that as um, a modality of healing and then as someone who ultimately became a facilitator and so some of those background details i think would be very fascinating sure um well um I'll start by saying, I guess I've always been interested in consciousness and exploring consciousness. Even since I was young, I've been always fascinated with, you know, spirituality and metaphysics and um, mysticism and consciousness and really exploring those things. Um, so, and, be, you know, now I've been facilitating Bufo and this is really all I do 24 seven um, for the past maybe five years or so. Um, so this is currently really all I do is to facilitate Bufo between, you know, doing integration calls and the actual ceremonies. That's pretty much full time what I do. Um, previous to being a Bufo facilitator, I was a photographer and a cinematographer. So I was in that industry mm. for about 15 years. Um, and I loved it. Uh, I really loved it. And um, I enjoyed, you know, getting paid for doing what I loved, which is still what I do. You know, I still get paid to do what I love. Um, but, uh, you know, during these 15 years as a photographer, I would 
participate in sacred plant medicine ceremonies. Um, you know, maybe when I was introduced, my first introduction to plant medicines, like most people, is cannabis. And I really enjoy cannabis. And I still consider it one of my favorite plant medicines to mm -hmm. work with. Yeah. Um, and you know, that started out kind of recreational as it does for most people. And then maybe in my mid twenties, I started to take, um, plant medicines more seriously in a more ceremonial setting. Um, so maybe when I was like 25, I started to participate in actual plant medicine ceremonies. Um, you know, psilocybin, ayahuasca, uh, different heart opening medicines, um, and uh, I really grew a lot spiritually. I really learned a lot from working with these sacred medicines. And I found out that I'm really good at holding space for people, um, which is important for a facilitator. So, you know, I just got a lot of feedback from people that are like, you know, you're really great at holding space. You're really easy to talk to and you're a really good listener. And you're really, you know, I don't feel judged. I don't feel... Um, you know, like they feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the more I got that kind of feedback, the more I was like, you know, this might be something to to look into. And I really, you know, loved working with sacred medicines, being in ceremony, just participating. And then the more I kind of got that kind of feedback, I was like, well, maybe this is something to pursue. Uh, and, you know, I was still enjoying my photography work and my film work. Um, and um, I would just start to kind of like, co-facilitate and help other facilitators just kind of help out in ceremony um you know for these ayahuasca and psilocybin ceremonies and it wasn't until maybe like six seven years of working with these other medicines that i even heard about bufo i had never heard about bufo even though i had been in this community working with ayahuasca all these things for a good like i said six or seven years i had never heard of bufo and then I was in a ceremony, participating in a ceremony. I forget if it was ayahuasca or what. But I was particip participating in a ceremony, and I met my mentor, my Bufo mentor. And um, he told me about Bufo. And uh, I was very intrigued. Uh, it sounded really fascinating. And I honestly, I didn't do too much research. I really trusted um, John, my mentor. Uh, I really got a good vibe from him. We really connected. And um, I trusted him. So uh, after meeting him in ceremony, maybe a couple of weeks later, I set up an appointment to have a ceremony with him to have my first Bufo experience. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I went to meet him for the ceremony. And even though I had had profound, life changing, really transcendental experiences with these other medicines, with ayahuasca, with psilocybin, really life changing experiences, the Bufo was like, you know, that was it. That yeah. was the clarity. That was that you know, that knowing, that gnosis, that experience that up until then was really just intellectualized and, and conceptualized. And, you know, all these things that we, you know, I had been reading about spirituality and, you know, religions and philosophies for my whole life. And you hear a lot of the same things. And it's like, yeah, we could have an intellectual understanding of these things. Um, infinity, unity, uh, all these things that we think we might have a human concept of, but to experience, you know, that infinity, uh, that nothingness, uh, you know, it's really profound and it's really unlike any other, like, yeah, you could get there with meditation, with no medicine, without these other medicines, but the Bufo, you know, it really takes you right there to that, um, infinite divine consciousness. Um, so, yeah, all these things that I had only intellectual intellectualized before, now I had experienced it and I knew it. And, um, yeah, a lot of people, I feel like they have their first Bufo experience and they're ready to start spreading it and, yeah. it and, and all that. Um, but I don't feel like I had that experience. I was definitely like, wow, that's amazing. I want to kind of tell people about this and let people know about it. But I wasn't it wasn't like I was immediately like, let me start apprenticing. Let me start serving. Um, it wasn't until maybe a while later that I kind of felt the calling to to start apprenticing. So, I, you know, and I feel like it's important to personally work with the medicine, you know, dozens of times before you even think about holding space for somebody else. Um, so, I, you know, I'd worked with uh, the medicine personally 
I don't know how many more times. And then, you know, I started to apprentice. Uh, and, um, yeah, I worked with my mentor, John, and I, we still, we're still very close. Um, but I, you know, apprenticed with him for about a year or so. Um, but we were serving, you know, a dozen people a day, every day. So I sat through a good, you know, couple of thousand ceremonies before I started, um, serving on my own. So I definitely got a lot of experience apprenticing and I learned a lot and, um, yeah, and now I'm serving on my own. <laughs> yeah. Well, that um, just brought up a number of things I'd like to circle back around and talk to you about. And, and first is kind of going back into what you mentioned about your childhood. And I think that this is a, sort of a very interesting feature that comes up sort of a lot in this medicine space where we have individuals who say, well, yeah, well, even as a kid, I was really interested in sort of the deepest questions. And, and that's, yeah. that's the side that I can really identify on because I know that I, as a little kid, I was raised completely secular, no spirituality or any religion. And I'm like – is God real? And how would I know? And what's really going on here? And, and is any of this stuff that people say is about religion, is, is any of that true? Is it all just made up? And, you know, so I, I kind of started out that way. That was sort of a natural inclination for me. And that's something that a lot of people that I talk to in interview, you know, they say, yeah, as a kid, I was really interested in these questions. And then there is Another area is where people say, yeah, I was raised religious, but then I became really disaffected from that. And then I discovered spirituality through psychedelics or something. And then maybe a third category is people who have been traumatized and then they sought some relief and some aspect of healing. And that's what mm -hmm. got them into the space. Yeah. But you're definitely in the first category from what you've described. So I just wanted yeah, to yeah. ask you a little bit more about your childhood. Um, and that were you raised religious or spiritual by your parents? Was this something that was mostly internal? I mean, wh where do you think, where do you identify uh, this sort of inquisitive nature as coming from? Wh where do you feel it originated? Um, I mean, I feel like we're all born with it, with this inquisitive nature. We're here to explore and we're here to learn and we're here to ask questions. Um, and I think people just lose touch with that like they lose touch with the mystery and the explorative nature of why we're here so i guess i've always been that way and i you know i just remember yeah like you said just kind of pondering these existential questions even as a kid like well you know it's weird to be this to have this first person view and like be operating in this avatar and be like, it's just, you know, it was very strange to me. And like, how come nobody's asking more questions yeah. about this? I mean, it seems like, yeah, whatever. Like I'm happy to just, you know, watch TV and go to work and whatever. And I'm like, whoa, there's so many questions that need answering here. Like there's so much to explore. Um, and most people just don't seem interested. Uh, so, um, and, and you know, I grew up going to, to Catholic school. I wouldn't say mm. I grew up religious, like, you know, at least most people where I'm from, if you went to Catholic school, I'd say, you, you know, you, you most people go through their atheist period because you go to Catholic school and you're like, man, this is a bunch of BS. Uh, <laughs> this, this is not what it's about. Um, so I would not say I grew up religious. I mean, maybe when I was younger, my parents would kind of drag me to church. But I, you know, I kind of figured out pretty early that this isn't what it's about, like the dogma and like the rules and um you know, there's no formula and there's no dogma to follow to really, you know, experience that unconditional love. It's just something we, we, we experience and, you know, um, there's no formula to get there. Uh, so, um, yeah, I would say, you know, I kind of grew up, you know, getting this religious stuff kind of shoved down your throat and you're like, this isn't, what I, this doesn't resonate with me. There's got to be something outside of this. So I think oh, it's kind of typical and I might have swayed a little bit to the more kind of atheist scientific uh, approach, the kind of material reductionist view yeah. uh, for maybe like my late teens, early 20s, um, a little bit of that where you're like, all right, I'm just going to really focus on the scientific aspect of things, what's provable, what's, you know. And then getting into that, you read about all this quantum physics and mechanics and stuff, and it like kind of reinforces a lot of the spiritual stuff to a degree. Um, so then that kind of, I feel like, leads a lot of people back into like the spiritual realms. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that kind of world. So that was kind of my path where it's like, all right, well, a lot of this kind of non-locality, a lot of this um, quantum entanglement, it starts to make a lot of sense with that kind of spiritual stuff that, you know, I read about. Um, so that's, I would say, how I kind of got back into the more spiritual uh, aspect and mindset and therefore kind of treated um sacred medicines with a little bit more respect versus like the recreational um approach yeah um so yeah uh, you know i kind of got back into spirituality after kind of like getting pointed back in that direction through the scientific route yeah well the, interesting there's some parallels with myself there that i i didn't go to catholic school but um definitely there was a lot of people who identified as Christians within, you know, my elementary school and junior high and high school. And I w was one of those people who sort of self-identified as an atheist for a while. But, I, you know, looking back on it now, I can see mainly that was I was anti-religion, that I didn't, I, didn't right. like, I didn't like the rules, I didn't like the doctrines, I didn't like the dogma, I didn't like the, well, we believe this, so it's true. So then I kind of spilled over to the, yeah, atheists, you know, and I had a binder right. and I wrote atheist rule on it. And I was definitely <laughs> into the, the whole scientific approach. But I, I would agree with you that once we get into quantum physics, it gets a little weird. And so it does open up more questions about, okay, so what really is the nature of consciousness? How does it relate to observable reality? What is this intermeshing between the observer and that which is observed? And, and um, then eventually made my way into spirituality through Buddhism. Um, but, and this is kind of brings us to the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, though I actually know I'm skipping, so, but we'll come back to it. But the idea of um, direct experience versus intellectual understanding, because that's, that's where I felt I was getting this sort of this intellectual understanding from Buddhism and started practicing as a meditator, but wasn't getting a lot at the experiential and the, the immediate gnosis level. But before we get into that, I did want to go back to um, the phrase that you used that I'd like you to maybe unpack and expand on a little bit more because it gets used a lot in medicine circles and in ceremonial work, this idea of holding space. And I think at the most, at the most basic kind of naive level, I've seen people say, well, holding space means sitting down and literally holding the space with your hands and making a container for people mm -hmm. to have their experience. And, mm -hmm. and I said, well, okay, that's, Maybe that's an understanding of what holding space is, but maybe you could share a little bit more about that. And, and also from the idea that, you know, of course, here on the podcast, there's a lot of people who have been to ceremonies, they've been to facilitated medicine experiences, but of course, there's also a lot of people who just explore on their own. And so this idea of somebody who's holding space, what, what is that? Um, so we can assume maybe there's at least somebody who doesn't or is not familiar with that terminology. So how would you define that and express that concept and idea? Well, I would say holding space is really about maintaining presence, a non-judgmental presence and a safe container for the person to explore and express whatever needs to be explored and expressed. Um, as a facilitator, I see a lot of other facilitators that might have this mentality, whether subconsciously or very overtly of like, it's my job to heal this person. I'm going to heal this person or the medicine is going to heal this person. But I think it's important for people to realize that the facilitator is not healing you. The medicine is not healing you. We are providing a space for whatever transmutation or quote unquote healing, which is really just remembering our, you know, that we're already perfect. It's really providing a safe container for somebody to explore their consciousness without judgment, without trying to fix the person or heal the person or um, making it about you. You know, a lot of times it may be like, let me put on some theatrics and like, but it's like, no, it's like your job to just provide a safe container for the person to have their experience. It's not your job to interpret the experience for them, to try to fix them, to try to play therapist for them. It's your job to give them a safe space to have their experience. Yeah. So that's what I would say, like the simple definition of holding space is maintaining presence. And that means like really being present, not like wondering like, oh, when's this going to be over? Not scrolling on your phone, not looking out the window, really maintaining presence. And like, a, you know, doesn't mean you have to sit and look at the person with eagle eyes because that gets a little bit too uh, 
distracting to. Um, it's really just maintaining a neutral, not judgmental presence and keeping the person safe. Um, so that's really what it's all about. Yeah. And I wonder what you might think of sort of the idea, like something that was just coming to my mind is thinking about this is that, um, because I'm totally in agreement that, that the, whoever's facilitating, they're not actually healing the person. The medicine isn't necessarily healing the person. Um, that it's really, it's, it's them having their experience of themselves and within the realm of holding space, there's, there's maybe the idea that this is just what came to mind is maybe more the idea of like a conductor of an orchestra that we have these different elements that are taking place. And so the conductor is not playing any other of the instruments is not doing anything that way, but is holding the space, holding the container and kind of, Oh, maybe now's a good time to bring in this element. Maybe now's a good time to bring in this element. Now we need to speed it up. Now we need to slow it down a little louder, a little softer. And so that there is room I, I feel there's room for like direction and guidance, but as you say, it's not necessarily giving an interpretation. It's not putting on a show. Um, but you know, sometimes in these very subtle ways of, yeah, well now I am looking at you. So now you feel that and now I'm not. And now you feel that as well. So these small little judgments that the facilitator makes can have a big impact on what the person experiences from sort of that orchestral perspective of, of the conductor of bringing in elements to help help the event take place yeah i feel like that's definitely a, a real part of it too and i really like how you describe it as being uh yeah you're a conductor of an orchestra because that's really what it is so it's a lot of intuition and like um just going with the flow and trusting yourself and what needs to happen um but yeah, it's not forcing anything. It's not like having any expectations. It's really just, oh yeah, we, she, you know, they might benefit from incorporating this element or that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can resonate with that, with kind of orchestrating the ceremony a bit for sure. Um, yeah, and I definitely, you know, I definitely incorporate different elements, um, smudging and drumming and stuff like that. Um, but. I would say most important is keeping a, a safe container for the person to have their experience. Yeah. So I'm jumping around a little bit because there's still things I want to come back to and talk to more about, but since, since it just came up, let's go ahead and talk about that. What, what do you see as that safe container, particularly for Bufo? And, and since you did mention that you've spent a lot of time with ayahuasca, what are some of the differences? And, um, this will then also relate back to what you were saying of how you said that, you know, you had a lot of deep experiences with ayahuasca, but Bufo was something different, that it, it made something that was more intellectualized, it made it more tangible and real for you. So these are two different ways of sort of talking around how ayahuasca or Bufo might be different or similar and in concerns of how you're holding space and what happens in that space for people. So it's kind of a multi-pronged question. Sorry, there's too many elements to that, but you can take that up wherever you want, or I could clarify if you need me to. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, I would say, um, you know, to kind of answer how Bufo, oh, at least my experience with Bufo versus ayahuasca. And, you know, I would say my pre-Bufo ayahuasca experiences were much different than my post- UFO ayahuasca experiences because I would say like yeah like I mentioned I had a lot of I learned a lot of great lessons and I learned a lot um, and you know I experienced a lot with ayahuasca um, but to be honest I still feel like it like it left me searching from for something like I didn't get the you know the final answers yeah uh, whereas with Bufo, you're like, all right, I got it. Like, I really don't ever need to do another plant medicine again. Like I got the message. I'm God, I'm infinite, I'm divine. Uh, I know. And nobody could ever tell me otherwise. Like now I know, like, that's not something you're going to forget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where I was like with ayahuasca, like it might hint at it. You might get pretty deep and be like, yeah, we are all. Cause he, honestly before Bufo, like if you were to say like, yeah, we're all one, we're all, you, you know, we're all connected. I'd be like, oh, well, yeah. I mean, we're all, you know, brothers and sisters here on earth and we're all in this together and we're all a team and you know, it's our job to live in harmony. 
But with Buffo, you're like, oh, we're literally one. Yeah. Like, we're literally the same consciousness. Like, I'm talking to myself right now. <laughs> um, so that's the kind of clarity I mean, where it's like, you may think you know what it means to be one, to be infinite, but I didn't experience that until I experienced Buffo. Because um, I feel like, on, on, like I said, you could, you could achieve that non-dual state with no medicine, through meditation, through breath work, uh, through ayahuasca, through Buffo. I mean, Bufo is, I think, the best catalyst to take you there uh, to that non-dual state. Um, but with ayahuasca, maybe if you've worked with it, you know, dozens and dozens of times, you might get to that, um, you know, non-dual state that I feel like people get to on Bufo. But for the most part, your ego is still engaged on some level, hence why it tends to be visual for most people, because you're still in these realms of duality. For the most part, I mean, yeah, like I said, it's possible to get to that non-dual state. But I'd say for the most part with ayahuasca, you're exploring higher realms um, that are still in duality. I mean, you could see some sacred geometry and kind of tap into those angelic realms and stuff like that. But those realms, you're still experiencing duality. There's still a subjective eye. There's still, you know, other beings or other things. Like, there's still that duality. Yeah. Um, so... Um, also too, for the most part, I mean, I've been to many different types of ayahuasca ceremonies, some a little more traditional, um, some not a little more modern, I guess you could say. Um, but I'd say for the most part it's pretty communal. Like it's about that community experience. Um, yeah, your individual experience too, but there's definitely that community aspect to it. And yeah, I do have group UFO ceremonies, but I feel like it's really about that individual process um and um yeah and as far as uh you know the different containers like i'd say it kind of like with any medicine your job is to keep the person safe and yeah just with ayahuasca there tends to be more of that group setting so that's just another element to kind of deal with versus like with bufo it a lot of times it's just the individual you're kind of holding space for um so I don't know, you want to kind of... Yeah, actually, I just wanted to jump in on something sure. that you said that I think is also um, somewhat common, where you said that with, with your ayahuasca experiences that you would be comfortable saying, yeah, I feel we're all one, we're brothers and sisters, we're all in it together. And I do think that that's something that arises for a lot of people and a lot of medicine experiences. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how it tends to have more of maybe sort of an emotional sort of resonance or tone to it in that sense. Like, yeah, because especially when it's group work, right, that there's a sense of bonding and, you know, oh, and we're in nature and so I'm feeling bonded with nature and I feel like I'm a part of it. And so there's sort of that emotional aspect to it and that, that group sense to it. And kind of what I feel you're describing with Bufo, which is what I've definitely felt about 5-MeO, is that it's just, it's so dramatic and so it's not even emotional in that sense it's just like yeah it's all one look look see isn't it just isn't it obvious so it's not even a sense of oh yeah we're all together it's just like oh wow it's like literally all one and just the clarity of that as you say you know no one can take that away from you no one can argue yeah. against it because it's just like look this is this is just the most true thing I've ever experienced. So yeah, and to maybe you know, I, not to disrespect ayahuasca at all. I think it's a great medicine, but yeah. I would ayahuasca hints at it, whereas bufo, you know, it, it takes you there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and like I said, there's plenty of people that I've, I'm sure had the non-dual ego dissolution, that unity consciousness experience with ayahuasca with just meditation. Um, but as far as like speaking about things generally, like the Bufo will take you right there to that unity consciousness. For most people, I think ayahuasca will kind of hint at it for a few ceremonies and maybe you'll kind of get to there eventually. Uh, but not like the Bufo takes you there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So another thing that you mentioned that I wanted to circle back around on um, that I think is quite significant is... You know, there's so part part of what's up in the book and sort of in in the field these days around facilitation. Um, you know that some people say, well, it's really important to study with a lot of different people and learn a different bunch of different methods and a bunch of different styles. 
And um, that is what's significant for being a facilitator. And other people say, well, really, you just need a lot of personal experience yourself with whatever medicine it is that you're using and then start from there. And then another perspective is also adding in this idea of, and this is something that I've, I've personally felt is very important with 5-MeO-DMT, is that before anyone starts thinking about serving or facilitating, in addition to having your own certain amount of experience with it, actually having the opportunity to observe large numbers of people have an, an experience with Bufo or with 5-MeO so that you can really observe the wide range of reactions. You know, and the example that I always give is that when I had my first full 5-MeO DMT experience, it was just absolute ecstasy, bliss, non-dual clarity. And I mistakenly thought, oh, it just does that. It's like, it's so right, easy. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. just does that. But it was by observing, because it did that for me every time, but then observing other people, I realized, oh, that's actually not automatic. I mean, it's right. that potential is there, but it's not automatic. And there's lots of different ways that people react and process through the experience. So you mentioned that you saw, you, you helped participate in maybe 1,000 to 2,000 uh, oh yeah, people, people. more than that for sure. Yeah, definitely more than that. So yeah. I've seen I've seen many processes, like thousands of processes for sure. And I do think that's important because, um, like you mentioned, I think it's important to have your own personal experience with whatever medicine you you want to serve um, for a few reasons. Number one, you need to guide somebody through it. Like you need to know all the nuances of what could happen, um, all the kind of nuances of the trip from how that ego ego dissolution may happen to how that ego may start to come back online to all the things in between to all the things that may happen in integration. You, re, you really need to have a, a, you know, a big knowledge of that stuff. Um, so yeah, your own personal experience with the medicine is really important. Like I said, I think you should work with it dozens of times before you even think about even holding space for somebody else, let alone serving yeah. somebody else. Yeah. So you definitely want your own experience with the medicine. I see a lot of people that have one Bufo experience and they think they're ready to share it with other people. Um, and I see a lot of people that have a real fear of the medicine and they still think they could say, and it's like, no, you got to get over that fear. You can't be bringing that into your ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it's important for you to really have worked with the medicine a lot on your own as an individual. And um, also I think it's, important like you said to see the wide spectrum of reactions people ha could have because you know like you my first experience was that clarity that bliss that you know experience that i hope everyone has um but yeah not everybody gets there the first time or, or ever um so i think it's important to see the wide spectrum of reactions because a lot of times too people you know they want to come and and help and hold space and um you know, they might have had a few experiences that are really peaceful and blissful, and then they come with a friend, or they come to hold space, and then they see somebody go wild, yeah. and they're like, oh, I didn't know that could happen. Um, so I get a lot of people, I mean, now I really just work with my partner, Lauren, she's great, she's perfect, um, but to start out, I kind of like just get whoever I needed, like, oh, I just need a hand to help me in case this person gets wild, I just need help restraining this person. Um, and people come, and it's like, most people, when they see what happens in a Bufo ceremony, they just kind of freeze up like a deer in the headlights and they're like, I didn't know that could happen. Um, so yeah, you, you really need to see the wide re ranges of reactions people have. You need to know that you might need to wrestle people, restrain people. You need to know people might get aggressive. People could get um, really wild and it's your job to protect them um, first and foremost. Um, so when you're not ready to like, you know, deal with that, uh, you, you know, you don't really have any business serving people. So I think it's important to see all those, you know, reactions people get after the medicine and also to kind of have experience helping people through integration um, because a lot may come up in integration and a lot of trauma may come up and a lot of stuff that, um, you know, you might not be used to dealing with. So I think it's important to get that experience beforehand. Yeah. And Going back to this idea of holding space and really appreciating that none of what we're discussing here is about any kind of judgment or evaluation of people. You know, like as we have said, both you and I, we had very positive, very 
essentially easy sounds like easy experiences the, yeah. the, those first experiences and it's just it doesn't happen for everyone and it's not because it's their fault it's not they're not bad they're not doing anything wrong it's just that different people come with different stuff yeah in that moment and as you say some people really do act out some people get violent some people thrash around some people get just deathly deathly terrified yeah. so there's you know everybody's bringing their whole life history into that event and really having a deep understanding of that and knowing that, okay, everyone's going to present in, a, in a, their own different unique way. And you only really learn that through lots of observation. Of yeah. Things. And lots of experience because yeah, the first couple of times, like you, you know, it's normal to get nervous. It's normal to, you know, it's normal for you as the facilitator or, or the person holding space to kind of get a little bit panicked, like, oh, this person's freaking out. They're screaming. They're getting wild. And, you know, it's our job as a facilitator to remain calm, remain, you know, pretty neutral and non judgmental, and to just keep the person safe. Like, because I've had people come that don't have as much experience and they, you know, like I said, they might sit there with the deer in the headlights look and really, you know, perpetuate the fear like they themselves are more scared than anybody or i'll have you know i might have you know uh, a couple come and you know at, like the other day i had you know a, a couple come and the husband was going and the wife was just holding space and and you know observing and she, the husband started to really scream and thrash and looked like he was going to get violent and she i could tell she was getting terrified so i'm like you, you got to leave the room like yeah can't be feeding in that fear you can't be giving off that energy and feeding in that energy so i think it's important um and i mentioned this in the book is like your energy as a facilitator your ego has a lot of input in the ceremony so if you're you know vibrating at a place of fear or judgment or like when is this going to be over this person's annoying like people you know people pick up on that for sure yeah. um and I, I really like that you um, added in this element of, of the couple because this is one of the most difficult situations that I personally that I encountered was, you know, when you have people who are in a partnership or a couple and one person is reacting, that there is the tendency of the other one like, oh, I want to fix this or, or I'm yeah. really worried like how do, how do I care for this person? But I, I love that you mentioned that part of the role of, facilitator sometimes is to say, actually, I'm going to need you to leave the room right now because this, this isn't concerning you. You don't need to yeah. do anything about it. And so there is that importance of maintaining the integrity of the space. And sometimes that does mean inviting people in and other times it means inviting people to leave, but it is about controlling the space. And that's one of the things that sometimes when I see these videos on YouTube or every people are just walking around or people are taking photos or doing video or people playing music kind of randomly, it's like, there's no control of the space. And it's not that we want to be controlling, but it is about, again, as that sort of that conductor idea of, well, I want to make sure that the right elements are coming in at the right time to best serve this person who's having this very unique and very powerful experience. And so sometimes it does take a little direction. Oh yeah. And there's plenty of times. Um, and like I said, there's some, most of the time I'd feel like it's just an, an individual coming and it's me and my partner, Lauren holding space for an individual. But there's plenty of times where, you know, a couple may come or two friends or a group of friends. And, um, yeah, there's plenty of times where maybe a group of friends comes and, you know, I, I always serve each person one at a time. It's not like you could really serve, you know, three or five yeah, people at yeah. once. Like you, you, I always go one at a time, wait for the person to complete their process. And, okay, now let's move on to the next person. So, you know, I'm used to holding space. I just sit there and meditate. Um, but you get some people, they're looking at their phone, whatever. And I'll say to them, this is not the place to look at your phone. If you yeah. want to look at your phone, step outside. Like, this is not the place for this. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important, too, um, not to be looking at your phone, not to be having conversations in, you know, the other room. Um, if you want to come and hold space, you get to sit there and hold space, um, you know. And it's not about, and a lot of people, too, whether it's a facilitator, co-facilitator, or just somebody there to hold space, if you're holding space for somebody, it's about kind of focusing and holding space for that person. It's not about going into your own process and kind of working on yourself. It's like holding space for that person. And you'll have your turn for your ceremony, but you know, right now we're holding space for, for this person who's going. So I, I think that's important um, yeah. to honor that. Yeah, I want to um, 
reiterate that as well, because that's also something that I've seen, just as you're saying, where someone who is supposed to be holding space, they're, they're sympathetically, they're experiencing whatever's going on. Um, and this is especially true with people who have experienced the medicine before. So they kind of, they can vibe into it and they start going into their thing. And it's like, um, but it's not your turn right now. So if you're going to have a whole thing, you need to go outside. Right. Yeah. You, this is the person having their turn right now. And, and it's interesting how, how many ways people can complicate the issue of holding space and just being present for, for one person. Again, it's not to judge or blame anyone because we're not necessarily trained on how to do that. Um, but there's lots of different ways that people might sort of accidentally participate in a way that they're not even realizing that they're participating and they might even feel that, well, no, this is my experience and I'm supposed to be able to have my experience. Yeah, but it's not your turn. So. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's just something I feel as people, you know, it's important for people to realize, like, if you're holding space, it's about holding space for the person. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into um, when you decided that you wanted to actively start serving and facilitating. Um, how did like you said, you, you were in thousands of ceremonies. So when did that transition come? And you say, yeah, you know what? I'm ready. I'm going to do it. Oh, I would say that my mentor, John, he really had to kind of kick me out the door because I really, I, this is a huge responsibility, kind of really one of the biggest responsibilities I could think of. You're really, um, you know, people are very vulnerable. A lot of trauma may come up, a lot of emotions may come up. And one of the most profound experiences a person could have Um and if you don't do it correctly, you honestly could do a lot of damage, psychological, you know, damage to somebody. So I think it's a real responsibility, aside from just knowing all the medical, you know, complications that might happen or things like that. So I definitely took it very seriously. And, you know, I kind of felt like I need to really sit through a thousand more ceremonies before mm -hmm. I start serving people. Um, but, uh, yeah, with a little bit of um, push from my mentor, he kind of was like, yeah, start serving on your own. And, um, you know, I still communicate with him and, you know, work very closely with him and ask him for advice and, and stuff like that. Um, but I would say he really kind of pushed me uh, like I, you know, <laughs> I would have, you know, just kept apprenticing for a while. Um but then, yeah, I kind of started out on my own and, you know, there's a lot of learning that comes with that um, to kind of be on your own and not have, you know, the training wheels on. Um, and, um, yeah, I just trust it and I feel like I'm very good at it and uh, it just has been working out really well. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I want to ask you more about your own ceremonies, but actually I was just looking at my notes from things that you had mentioned before. And so this was one thing that I also wanted to come back to, um, cause this is another common theme that comes up for a lot of people that you mentioned that your experiences of other medicines changed after your Bufo experience. And this, oh, this yeah. is one of these really interesting phenomenon where we don't, we don't tend to hear that when people say, well, yeah, after I took mushrooms, all my other psychedelic experiences changes or after ayahuasca or even after DMT, but after Bufo or 5-MeO, people say, well, er everything changed at that point. Like even the, I just got a manuscript from someone who's um, currently living in Asia and he said that he marks his life by before Bufo and after Bufo. Um, yeah, that's, I would say that too. <laughs> yeah. So d tell us a little bit about that for yourself. Um, well... Like, for example, I would say the first time that I worked with ayahuasca, um, it was, you know, like you, I hear other people's accounts of their first time with ayahuasca and they were like, oh my God, it was like, um, they were purging and they were terrified and there were these visuals and, you know, my first ayahuasca experience is like, I kind of felt mildly high and, um, at peace and really calm and everybody around me was like purging their brains out. They were really struggling and I was just kind of sitting there in a meditative position, like, you know, just meditating and I would get these thoughts like, Oh, like that person really needs some help. I should, I should go help that person or, you know, that person needs some support. 
and ayahuasca, you know, I'd get these kind of thoughts or messages from the medicine that was like, don't, you don't need to do that. You don't just be, just be mm-hmm. like, you know, you don't need to fix anything. You don't need to help those people in a way by helping them. You're kind of like taking away from their experience. They need to learn these things on their own. Like you can't do the work for them. You can't like alleviate their suffering for them or their work for them. They, they got to do it themselves. Yeah. You could provide like a safe container, like we said, and hold space for them to have their process, but I can't fix them. The medicine can't fix them. Um, so I would say my, you know, first experience with ayahuasca, you know, was pretty, pretty mild. We'll say like it wasn't some super profound realization. It was just like, just be, you know, and I was like, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and they got deeper and deeper as I worked with different medicines and with ayahuasca, you know, you know, had more ceremonies, but then after Bufo, you know, it's just like things you instantly could get a lot deeper instantly. You can get to that non-dual state if you want to, and just kind of be in that Mm -hmm. state in that being. Um, but it's just, you have much more ease of navigating different densities, dimensions, different realms, or, you know, different aspects of ourselves. Um, and yeah, I just feel like you have this deeper relationship with the medicines after Bufo. The Bufo really clears out, really opens up your chakras, kind of clears out your whole energetic and spiritual field so that you're much more receptive to, you know, these other medicines and could work with them a lot more deeply. Um, whereas like before Bufo, like these medicines could be very helpful and really help us release some trauma or some blockages, but it's not like Bufo that kind of clears everything out, at least for me, like it just cleared out everything. And after that you had, you know, much easier access to working with these other medicines. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, let's get into talking about, um, how you facilitate. Um, so I'll, I'll let you give the details, but just, um, like in the, in the book facilitating five MEO DMT, we have some people who facilitate outside. There's some people who work in retreats. Um, some people who, you know, do a nature walk, you know, so there's all different kinds of contexts in which people are doing it, but let's hear about, um, how you like to serve and what kind of format you like to use. Um, well, as far as like indoors, outdoors, like I do both. Um, and same like indoors, outdoors, individuals, small groups, maybe larger groups. Like, yeah, I kind of work in all those ways. Um, but as far as like how my actual ceremonies go, um, I, my mentor was kind of trained in the Siri tribe tradition. So we take a lot of elements from that. Um, I would say, you know, first of all, as far as like the ceremonies, I definitely uh, will have a call with each person before. I definitely explain a lot, get their background, mm. um, really have a thorough kind of intake and introduction call. And then for the actual ceremonies, um, usually I'll have people read a prayer before that comes from the Siri tribe that I've kind of modified a bit. So it's not as um, religious sounding as <laughs> how they have it. Um, but I usually have the people read a prayer before if they're comfortable with it. And most people are, I mean, you know, most people are comfortable reading the prayer before. And, um, you know, after that, I'll just have them take a couple deep breaths and then they inhale and then they just lay back and surrender. Like it's just your job to surrender. And as I'm sure, you know, some people, they just lay there peacefully, in which case I just sit there and meditate with them. Um, some people could get pretty wild and dynamic and aggressive, in which case we might have to do some wrestling and restraining. Um, and, um, I will like, usually as soon as a person lays down, if they don't get too explosive right away, I'll do some drumming and the drumming, I feel like number one, it's a good indication. And I tell them before, like, if you hear the drumming, right after you inhale, because I give them a big enough dose that they should experience that ego dissolution immediately. Like I know some people might start with like what they call like the handshake dose or kind of ease people into the ego dissolution across, you know, a few smaller doses. Yeah. But um, for the most part, I'll give people a full dose where they're going to have that ego dissolution pretty much immediately as soon as they lay down. Um, so I'll do some drumming and I'll tell them if you hear the drumming, ask for some more because yeah. you haven't experienced that ego dissolution yet. Um, so for most of the time they do, um, 
So I'll do a little bit of drumming that's mainly, to be honest, an indication, you know, for them to like ask for more if they need to. Uh, it's just a good sign, a good way for them to ask for more. Also, I do feel like the energetics of it, the vibration, that drumming really helps kind of shake loose some of that energy, helps kind of some of those people that might really resist and be clinging on and attaching, even though like with the, with the dose I give, like your resistance is pretty futile. So yeah. like you know, some people that are really clinging on to drumming, I feel like helps kind of just kind of shake them loose a little bit. Um, so I do do some drumming and yes, yeah, smudging and, um, you know, feathers and, and that kind of energetic work. Um, but I'd say for the most part, I'm just sitting there meditating and holding space. Um, sorry, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, I, I like this sort of, um, drumming as the, the, the gauge for deciding if, if the individual wants more or not. Like what I used to tell people, cause I was the same way that I wanted people to get enough to let's just go all the way. Okay. Cause sometimes yeah. people would say, well, can we just, can we just take little doses and work up? And it's like, no, no, let's just go all the way in. Yeah, but I would tell people because people would ask like, well, how do I know if I've had enough? And I said, well, if you can ask yourself, I wonder if I've had enough, then the answer is no, you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so this is kind of like with the drumming, like if, if you can hear the drumming and if you're able to identify, Oh, he's drumming, then you're still in duality, right? Right, so you, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so so I feel like that's a great indication. So that's kind of the main reason I do it. Yeah. So when you're working with people, other than um, asking for more initially, do you also provide more over the course of the ceremony, or is it the idea like we're gonna have we're gonna have your one experience, we're gonna take you as deep as we can, and then we're gonna bring you back down, or do you do you offer that to go back in again, or what are your feelings on that oh I, I i if people want to i offer them the chance to have more medicine to go mm -hmm. back in again um but i really leave it up to the person some people they're like i'm done for today yeah. i don't want any more i never want to do this again yeah yeah <laughs> and you know there's some people too that i mean in rare cases i gotta cut them off like you've had enough for today buddy like uh, yeah <laughs> um so I'd say most people, they trust themselves and like, you know, I don't know the ratio, but some people just that one ego dissolving dose is enough. Some people, they want a little bit more to kind of just prolong the experience, maybe not necessarily have that ego dissolution again, but just kind of prolong that kind of comeback, yeah. you know, part of the experience. Um, or some people, yeah, they feel like, oh, there's like a, a, a blockage that could be released if I just do a little bit more. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely offer, offer the chance to do more. Um, so yeah. 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 And I think it's great that, um, you're kind of relying on people to use their own self-assessment. Like, uh, well, I think actually I could use a little more. I'm a little blocked, you know, that I think that it's such an important part of facilitating medicine is, um, doing whatever we can to, uh, inspire personal choice and responsibility within individuals to, you know, that don't rely on somebody else to tell you that you need to take more or, or even that you've, you've had enough, right? That pay attention to yourself and find, do you feel complete? Do you not feel complete? And then it's interesting that you mentioned, because I had a couple of these as well, people who would come over and it's like, can we do another round? Can we do another round? Can we do another round? It's like, yeah. And so <laughs> sometimes you do have to cut people off. It tends to be more rare, right? To find someone. It who's is very just, rare. Yeah. I, I will say it's very rare, um, but it does happen. I'd say of the thousands of people I could think of, maybe like two or three people where I've been like, all right, like <laughs> no more for you today. Um, but, um, um, Sorry, what were you mentioned before that? I wanted to comment on something you were mentioning before that. Um, um, sort of the, the self-regulating. Oh, yeah. like yeah. So that's something um, I really try to um, encourage people to do is trust themselves because a lot of times people will be like, do I need more? What do you think? And I'm like, I don't like whatever you feel. Like, trust yourself. Do you feel like you need more? Like, you want more? Um, do you, like you said, do you feel like you're complete for today? Like you don't want to force anything. You don't want to force the, you know, healing process. Um, so I really encourage people to trust themselves as far as if they want more medicine and even too, just from, you know, we mentioned this a little bit before, like interpreting people's experience, like, you know, people might ask me questions and based on my, you know, knowledge of working with the, uh, the, the medicine and my experience, 
I, you know, I might have more wisdom than, you know, the, that person. So I might share a little bit, but I really encourage people to kind of interpret the experience in them, themselves, um, not rely on me, not rely on, you know, other people to interpret it for them. Um, it's really, and that's really one of the fascinating things about being a facilitator is like people come out of their experience and I'm like, well, how was that? Tell, tell me about that. Like, yeah. you know, what did you experience and it's really, you know, fascinating to get these unique interpretations of that indescribable unity and, you know, that non-duality. Everybody has, like, beautiful ways of, of describing it. So that's part of the beauty is people's unique um, interpretations of it. So. Yeah, and I think that that is so important of not interpreting. And there, there's a really huge difference between interpreting somebody's experience versus helping them reflect on it from a place of greater experience. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And most of the time I'm really just asking them questions that are pointing them back inward. Like they'll be like, well, do I mean, just to be simple, like, well, what do you think? Well, it's like, well, what do you think? Like go back to it, like direct it more towards them. Or, um, so it's really about getting them to find the answers themselves and yeah, with, you know, a little bit of help, but yeah, not trying to do the work or do the interpretation for them. Yeah, I just think that that is such a tricky and sometimes problematic area because, I mean, as you know, I also do consultations and help people integrate their experiences. And sometimes people come to me and they say, well, yeah, I had this experience. And then the shaman came and said, oh, well, you've got an entity attached to you from a past life and you've offended the ancestors. And it's like, it's like all these stories are, and all these interpretations. And, and they're like, and is, is this really what's going on with me? And, you know, they want to know. You know, yeah, and, and I it, get that a lot too. And um, yeah, people will come and they'd be like, my shaman told me this. And I'm like, well, did you experience that? Yeah, or did this yeah. person tell you a nice little story that now you're attaching to? Um, because yeah, honestly, if you didn't experience it personally, I would really, you know, not too much, not put too much stock in it. Um, it might be true, but um, until you experience it yourself, I wouldn't really attach to that story. Yeah, good. Um, what kinds of clients would you describe yourself as working with? And and actually, actually, even I can ask you that question. Do you like the term clients? I forget in your um, contribution, if, if you have a term that you like to use for the people oh, that you serve or um, I actually, uh, I don't necessarily use clients or patients. I find it a little like clients seems a little businessy. Patient seems a little doctor, like, yeah. you know, a little, oh, I got my sick patient. Like, it just kind of stirs up that kind of mentality. I mean, I try not to label as much as I can. <laughs> I call people toadsters. I think that's a fun, you yeah. know. Okay. <laughs> I got a toadster coming. I got a toadster. But I, I try to, you know, avoid calling people clients or patients or, um, you know, so. <laughs> okay, good. Good. Yeah. Um, so then with the toadsters who arrive uh, to work with you, um, just tell us a little bit about, you know, what is the diversity that you've seen and what what have you perceived as bringing people to want to experience the medicine? Do you, do you find that there are themes? Um, well, I'd say uh, I definitely have served a very wide range of people from all walks of life, all ages, all, you know, backgrounds and classes. I've served billionaires to homeless people, to people, you know, struggling with heroin addiction, to people struggling with depression, to people dealing with trauma and PTSD and, you know, military veterans. And um, I serve a lot of doctors, um, psychologists and psychiatrists and medical doctors, mm -hmm. I'd say, you know, probably half the people I work with are medical professionals and psychologists and, and things like that and therapists. Um, and I work with people that come strictly for medical reasons, people that come for to treat their depression, to treat, you know, to kind of work through their trauma, to treat um, anxiety, uh, you know, to treat addictions. Um, they come strictly for medical reasons. Um, and I have people that come from more spiritual reasons, like people that are, um, you know, seeking spiritual growth or they want to experience that unity consciousness or, um, 
uh, you know, they just want to explore the medicine. Um, so really all types of people. Um, so I've got to meet a lot of fascinating and interesting people and, um, yeah, it's been great, Yeah, but all types of people, really all types of people, um, young, like teenagers to 80 year olds. Um, so yeah, all, all types of ages and stuff too. So. Yeah. I'm curious in the years that you've been doing this now, do you feel that there's been a shift in the demographic at all? And also, I'm curious if you've perceived um, an, any kind of change in demand, if there's been an increase or, or a decrease. And one of the reasons that I'm asking is that it, uh, I thought it was very interesting that you mentioned that there's been a lot of doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists. And um, now, you know, that 5-MEO is kind of, and BUFO is sort of a hot topic, culturally speaking, socially speaking. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you're getting more of those kinds of clients at this point, because now that maybe they've read about it, but I'm just curious if you have any perception of that, of if, has there been a shift or a change? Um, I would say like, I always got, um, like a wide range of people. Um, I would say now it's becoming more, you know, between just like articles and, you know, documentaries and YouTube videos and stuff like that. It's definitely become a lot more, uh, people have become a lot more aware of it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I guess I haven't noticed too much of a change as far as like different types of people coming. I feel like I always got a, a good range of people from people that I like, I heard Mike Tyson talk about it and it seemed cool yeah. and I want to do it to like, you know, people that have read your books and watched your talks and stuff like that, to, you know, all types of people. But, um, I'd say it's definitely become a lot more popular as far as like mainstream in the last couple of years or so. But to be honest, I haven't noticed too much of a shift in the types of people that come. It's always been a pretty wide range of people and I live in a pretty major eclectic city and there's all types of people. So it's always been a, a good mix of, of, of people for sure. Yeah. Well then that brings me to um, the next point. So you just kind of mentioned where you live a little bit and we're not going to get too into detail about that, but I wanted, mm -hmm. to, wanted to spend a little bit of time talking to you about sort of this dynamic of being an underground facilitator and also, you know, you're here on the podcast now, and I know that in our email exchanges that you had said that you had done your first podcast with someone that was a few weeks ago, maybe last month, and, you know, you're now a contributor to the Facilitating 5-MEO DMT book, so you're being a little bit more public. So I wonder if you could just share sort of your experience and perspective on that, of being an underground facilitator, um, working with toadsters, as you say, I want to use your terminology. <laughs> um, and like, like what answer do you give when people ask you like, Oh, Patrick, what do you do? Um, and yeah, just how do you navigate this space of being underground, but also now contributing to the public conversation and w whatever aspect of that you'd like to speak about? Uh, well, when people ask me what I do, I just tell them the truth at this point. I mean, maybe at first I was kind of like, ah, eh, maybe like let me dance around it or say, you know, I teach meditation or I teach like spirituality or something a little bit more vague like that. But now I tell people I serve Bufo, 5MEO, um, check it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as far as like navigating it, you know, the fact that it's not exactly legal where I am and it is pretty underground, um, I would say that. I really don't focus too much on that. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't advertise. I don't go out seeking people. Um, I really kind of wait for people to come to me. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a really healthy way, to, especially with Bufo. Like I, you know, there's some people that might go like, Hey, you got to go try this. And it's like, I feel like I wait for people to come to me when they're ready. Yeah. The universe will send them my way. I don't need to go seeking people. I don't need to go advertising or networking or trying to get people to come. Um, I really don't force anybody to come, you know, to do what they don't want to do. I've had people come for a ceremony. They read the prayer. I'm about to light the pipe and they're like, you know what? I don't want to do this. And I'm like, fine. Like, yeah. you know, I'm not going to force you to do it. Like, see you later. Um, so I would say I definitely don't go out seeking it. I wait for it to come to me and that, you know, the universe will just send people to me when they're ready. Um, so I have, a, I'm very grateful to have a steady stream of toadsters coming in, 
without doing too much um, seeking and searching and networking for them. They just come to me through word of mouth and, and stuff like that. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just careful about, you know, not saying like, hey, here's my name. Uh, this is what I do. Um, but other than that, I really don't think about it too much. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and it seems like you're comfortable in the role that you have, and it's supporting you well, so it seems to be going well. So here's kind of sort of an abstract question at this point, or maybe just hypothetical, theoretical. Um, but as we're moving potentially closer to above-ground psychedelic therapy and in the legal arena in the healthcare arena, you know, like the example that I always use now is here in Oregon, we've got the psilocybin initiative that's making its way through and um, come next year, there's going to be legal access to psilocybin services and experiences. Um, I'm just curious if you have uh, feelings or thoughts about that when it comes to 5-MEO, would you want to see this be uh, above board, open and public? Would you want to have regulating bodies and, you know, uh, commissions that either uh, approve your facilitation or, you know, or say, no, you need more training. I mean, just curious if you have any thoughts or feelings about sort of that potential that we're not there yet, but, you know, we might be. And of course, things are different in Canada and in Mexico, where the legal status is very different and, and people mm -hmm. do advertise. People are they're offering retreats and they have clinics and things like that. So here in the United States, the situation is obviously very different for those legal reasons, but yeah. Any reflections or thoughts on that sort of situation? Um, I mean, I will say, uh, I'm not a big fan of the current, uh, medical system or the healthcare system. I don't think there's anything healthy or caring about it for the most part. Um, so, <laughs> I don't really care what regulations are and what, you know, people tell me I can and can't do. I'm always going to do what in my heart I know is right and what resonates with me. Um, I do feel it's important to, you know, know what you're doing if you're going to be a facilitator, whether that means regulation or what. Um, I think it's important that um, people really, you know, facilitators really know what they're doing. Um, but to be honest, I see so much uh, so much wrong with the current healthcare system that it's you know <laughs> I don't have too much uh, too many nice things to say. Yeah. About <laughs> um, so I just I, you know I'm responsible for myself. I serve as best as I can with integrity, and I do my best to keep the people safe and help them integrate. Um, but you know. I can't be responsible for other people. I can't be responsible for the government. You know, it's just like, you know, it doesn't really concern me. I'm concerned with being, um, you know, the best version of myself I can and the best facilitator I can and remain in integrity. And, you know, that's, that's what I care about. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of facilitators um, that I, you know, I don't agree with what they're doing. So I just hope that there is... Um, you know, as far as regulation, just like, you know, people that um, kind of show the proper way to hold space, this proper way to kind of carry this medicine and serve this medicine. Um, but I could also see just based on our current um, indoctrinated medical system that, you know, it might not be my uh, ideal, you know, <laughs> my ideal situation that comes comes out right away as far as like, you know, the mainstream introduction of it, of 5MEO. So, yeah. Well, moving forward from this point, um, this is now your second podcast interview that you've done. Is that correct? That's correct. And I also want to take a chance if it's okay to plug uh, my podcast that's going to be coming out. Um, oh, Toad yeah. School, I'm going to start my own podcast. I've already recorded a few episodes and, um, so I'm starting a podcast where I have people that I've worked with share about their Bufo experience and, you know, how they've integrated it and how it's affected their lives. And I have some really um, articulate and eloquent people talking about their experiences. So I'm excited about that. But this is technically my second um, uh, time being a guest on a podcast. Yeah. 
Okay. And so you're starting up your own podcast. So that's exactly what I was going to ask you about is that, do you feel like now you have more of a role in the public that you want to kind of lend your yeah. voice to the conversation? Yeah, I more? That's one of the reasons I, I chose to participate in the book. When you asked me, I was like, man, I'm not a writer. I don't know. Same as I'm sure, like you mentioned in the beginning, there's a lot of people that are like, I can't write. Like, you know, I'm not a writer and there yeah. was a kind of stumbling block for them. Um, but I really felt like, oh, you know, I, I, I do my best to facilitate with integrity and do the best I can. And I just see so many people, like we mentioned, that are quick to facilitate. And they have good intentions, but they're quick to facilitate after doing Bufa once or like, yeah. oh, I went to a workshop and I spent a weekend learning how to facilitate. And I'm like, man, you need more than a weekend. <laughs> you know, learn this stuff. Uh, so I feel like it's important for me to kind of voice these things that um, – you know, based on my experience, uh, things I've seen. So I, you know, I just want people to work with this medicine safely. And, um, yeah, I just see a lot of kind of reckless behavior, a lot of inappropriate behavior, a lot of like manipulation and, um, yeah, stuff like that. So I think it's important to, you know, be an example and, um, share what I think are kind of the proper and safe ways to, to work with this medicine and facilitate this medicine. So yeah, I do kind of feel a bit of like a role to, you know, share with people, um, you know, what I think is the proper way to facilitate. Well, that's great. And it's an honor to be a part of helping you sort of launch this next part of, uh, your work in this realm. Yeah. Thanks so much for inviting me to be part of the book and giving me that outlet and that platform. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's been a, just a fantastic conversation today. Is there anything else um, you feel that we didn't touch on or just any final thoughts you want to leave the audience with from our conversation today? Um, well, a few things, you know, I would just want people to know. Um, I mean, I think the most import, important thing is to, you know, focus on love, be in your heart. Um, our awareness is our most valuable, most valuable currency. And it's like, what are you focusing your awareness on? Like, are you kind of mindlessly scrolling through Instagram? Are you kind of like reinforcing old patterns that aren't serving you anymore? Um, well, where's your awareness? Um, and to embody that awareness and, you know, take responsibility for your choices and take responsibility for the parts of your reality that you can control and don't stress too much about the things you can't control. Uh, let that stuff go. It's not your job to save the world, to fix anything. It's your job to be the best version of yourself you could be. And, you know, try not to, <laughs> uh, you know, try not to judge anybody else. Um, and also too, you know, I get a lot of people who, you know, they have that non-dual experience and they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. I want to be in that space all the time. And first of all, I would say we are in that space all the time. Yeah. You are always connected to that. You could always tap into that. If you just pause and breathe and get into the present moment, you, you, you know, you're connected to that. Um, so I get a lot of people that, um, you know, like the, I wish I was just in that space all the time. They get a little bit disappointed when they come mm. back to the human experience. Yeah. But um, that source energy, that infinite divine consciousness, it's always there. It's eternal. Like I said, we're always connected to it. This um, physical temporary incarnation, this is the real precious gift. So, uh, you know, I would focus and enjoy this as much as, as possible. Excellent. Well, I think that's beautiful and worthwhile advice for everyone. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing some of your own personal story and background and your, your views on facilitating 5-MEO and your sharing uh, your wisdom and experience and um, joining me here on the podcast and also joining as part of the book. Really appreciate it, and it's just a pleasure to have you here on The Entheogenic Evolution and help bring your voice out into the world. Thanks so much.
Thank you.